Hi guys, it is a gloomy day here in the end times in the former paradise of South Austin, Texas. You won't be hearing this uh, till early January, but it is actually Friday morning, December 29th, 2017. But we are going to leave Austin, Texas and head over to Scotland to talk to uh, one of my new Humpty Dumpty Tribe heroes and a new voice, well not a new voice from the Doomosphere for some of us, but this is my new buddy Ian Baxter. Uh, you might recognize the name Ian Baxter. I read an excellent essay sent to me by Kevin Hester from Damn the Matrix talking about how we are positively fucked uh, here on this planet. So obviously I needed to, to interview the man who thinks we are positively fucked, putting a positive message on the state of the planet here at the end of 2017. So I honestly don't know much about this man. Guys, he, I do know he has a degree in physics while he is not a quote professional climatologist he has certainly been following this issue for 40 years and clearly this man uh, understands uh, what it's what's shaping up on this planet so I am just going to turn it over to to Ian Baxter let him say hi give us a couple of minutes better introduction and then we're going to dive in to uh, this chat this is not an interview this is a chat so Ian Baxter Welcome to Humpty Dumpty, Dumpty Tribe. And, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to have a chat with you because I've been following many of your posts and many of those of uh, fellow doomers. Uh, and it's been interesting. Uh, just to give you a bit of background to myself, I was brought up in Liverpool. And as a teenager, I was interested in the weather, meteorology. And uh, as a result, I decided to study for a physics degree at Edinburgh University, which has an excellent physics department, and one which uh, has a bent towards meteorology and climate. Um, so I got an honours degree in physics at Edinburgh University. And what year well, was that, Ian? Well, I went in 1976, so I graduated in 1980. It was a four-year course. Uh, and during my time there, I came across an article in a newspaper about uh, the, the greenhouse effect. And this interested me as a scientist, it interested me, but it also worried me a bit as a, a human being. Because if, it's, um, if it came out the way it suggested, then it would be pretty disastrous. And I felt that we should follow the precautionary principle and at the very least start to prepare to make sure that we didn't allow it to happen. So, as you say, I'm not uh, a professional uh, scientist now, but I have kept a close interest reading books, reading articles, particularly on the internet over, over the last 20 years. And it's really only been in the last three years that it's frightened me. Uh, you mentioned uh, in our previous conversation Mike Ferrigan, Hi, Mike, if you're listening. But Mike and I have known, we've gone, we go back years, many years. We were, we were activists in the Green Party years ago when we, when we thought there, were, there, there, there was a chance. But, um, you know, uh, Mike and I have discussed this and I've discussed it with other people as well. But um, what frightens me even more now is that even though the evidence is quite strong, much stronger than it was even three or four years ago, it's still not on most people's radar. When I speak to people, they, they just they say, "Yeah, yeah, it's worrying. It's worrying. Uh, we must do something about it." Well, how can and you how can you say that? Ian, the, the the number one story on the planet today, in the mainstream well, media, is Donald Trump is uh, tweeting that uh, that that clearly, because it's cold in New York City. Uh, it, it, on, on, in December and January, that global warming is a complete total myth, and uh, there you go. There you go. You have the leader of the free world uh, calling well, global warming a myth. How can you say? I expect nothing less from Donald Trump. <laughs> but 
what worries me about it is that people will read that and believe him and they'll say yeah you know he's right it is really cold in in america but if you look at the climate realizer uh, chart for the um the, the, the air temperature anomalies across the northern hemisphere you'll see, see you'll see that there's a huge pool of cold air over the united states and canada but the rest of uh, the the northern hemisphere particularly the arctic is much warmer and if you average it out we are about a degree centigrade above where we should be uh, for the, you know, for this time of year so you know it, it's frightening really that people who are in power it's on the radar but uh, they're, they're trying to do the best to take it off everybody else's of course oh, of course that's what the that that's all yeah i it, i noticed last night it's quite a bit warmer in anchorage alaska uh than chicago and new york and uh, and the forecast over the next few days it will it will continue to be warmer in, in northern alaska than in new york and new england you look at the you know i've, I've been following the, the webcam and the temperature record at Oktiagvik, which used to be called barrow and uh, you know the temperature is there, and, and I, I'm, I must say, if I make a complaint about the Americans, it's that you still use Fahrenheit. But yes, I know. But in te centigrade terms, it's been in single figures, in minus single figures, whereas normally it's minus twenty to minus thirty. Yeah. You know, I read an article that this summer a child was stung by a wasp, and the wasp has never been seen before in Oktyagbe. You know, the, the, these sort of things should be hidden, the, 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 the main news. Not Donald Trump telling us all this a load of <laughs> bosh. Yeah. I'm well, I, I, I think the I, I think the point of making it the number one story on the planet was making fun of him, but I don't know. I on, I honestly don't know. Uh, yeah. at, at this point, what what these clueless morons are thinking, and uh, so anyway. Uh, uh, this sounds like a good a segue as any. As I mentioned when we were talking earlier, I have a pretty spare quote quote interview style. Uh, I only have four questions for you, and the rest will just take off from there. So yeah. let's do the the first two part question. Uh, and I think we know anyone who has read your essay knows the knows the great answer to this question is. Are we fucked, Ian? And if we are, how fucked are we at here at the end of 2017? Well, as to the first question, first part of the question, I'm very much with uh, Peter Wadhams on it, um, and I think you know I read uh, his book Farewell to Ice uh, last year when it came out, and it looked pretty worrying. You, uh, you got the impression that you were saying, "Yes, we are totally fucked," but. I'm not really allowed to say that, otherwise people stop listening to me. So he put in his book that if we um, develop nuclear power, I think, and, and if we uh, use geoengineering and we do this, that and the other, then we may be saved. Now, uh, listening to his interview since then, uh, I think that he knows that there's no uh, interest in doing anything about it. And even if there were, even if we did everything that he said in his book that we should do, he still thinks that you know we've got no chance. But I also agree with him that I, human extinction. You know, this question keeps coming up, um, particularly in, in Mike's um, uh, Facebook page. Human extinction is very is very difficult to achieve. You know, wiping out seven and a half billion of everything, if anything, is not going to be very easy to do. But I go with Peter Adams that although there may be one or two pockets who will survive across the globe, by the end of this century, I reckon we'll be down to less than ten million people, maybe a million. Uh, you know. So there is some benefit to uh, global warming. Well, the benefit for, for what survives, non-humans that survive, that can maybe start to patch up yeah, the mess yeah, we need yeah. for them. Um, but the, the, the reason why I don't think you know near-term full extinction is so likely is because yes, we could wipe out the the, the food from the seas, with phytoplankton dies out, if carbon dioxide acidifies the ocean, there'll be very very little living in it. 
Yes, it will be very difficult to, to grow crops in many places, but there'll be some crops that can grow, and not all crops require pollinating insects. I think sweet corn is one example that's pollinated by wind. So the, there will be small pockets across the globe that may uh, allow human life to, to continue. Uh, maybe it only lasts for 100 years before they all finally die out, I don't know. But to all intents and purposes, if you're going from 7.5 billion down to less than 10 million, I think you and I would call that extinction as far as our friends, family, uh, children, grandchildren are concerned. So people should really assume that it's, it's extinction. Um, so that's how fucked we are, positively. Um, and I think that what really isn't on people's radars is how quickly it's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, as I say, I followed the science, and the, the thing about, the, about nature is that things do happen abruptly. If you look at um, earthquakes, then you see the pressure builds and it builds and it builds and then suddenly bang, it goes. If you look at uh, thunderstorms, the charge builds and builds and builds and then bang, you get lightning stroke. You know, there's so many examples of this. Uh, somebody wrote a good scientific article once saying that uh, in nature, you'll have an equilibrium and you'll have pressure on that equilibrium and they'll try to resist it, and they'll keep trying to resist it, but then suddenly when it gives, it reaches a new equilibrium state. And I think that's very likely what will happen. We'll see you know, global temperatures at the moment around one degree above uh, what they used to be. We'll suddenly see it jump by about two degrees, and it'll stay there at three degrees for maybe 10 years, yeah. maybe 15 years, and then it'll jump again, and it might jump to five, to eight, you know, um, we know what kind of problems we've been hitting at one degree. So what kind of problems we'll hit at three degrees and then at five or eight, you know, and this will happen within the next few decades. So that's how fucked I think we are. Yep. So you, you're, you're with the, uh, with the suddenly, uh, you're looking at the over the cliff instead of the stair step. Um, well, the, the Arctic sea ice is another example of this. Everyone's looking at the extent, and the extent is it's coming, it's going, it's fluctuating about and generally declining. But the volume is dropping worryingly. You know, this is the, the death spiral that, um, that Peter Waddens refers to. You can see that it doesn't matter how big the extent is, if the thickness is zero, you've got no ice. Yeah. And that's what's happening. <clears throat> and you can see that suddenly there will be a collapse. And when you look at what's happening in the world, and, and this is the big change that will come from uh, the Arctic sea ice going, is the jet stream, the, 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 the difference in temperature gradient from the Arctic to the tropics. Well, and isn't that, and don't you will... think that what's happening be, between, as, I, as we were just talking about, that New York is a lot colder than northern Alaska, is, is that evidence that that is already beginning to happen? Absolutely. If you, if you look, they're all connected. If you look at what's happening in the Chukchi Sea, north of the Bering Strait, around about uh, Oktyagdrik and uh, northern Alaska, you can see that the, the, the sea ice there has not been forming this winter the way it should have done. Uh, and that's largely because there's a ridge, an upper air ridge, which is pushing milder air and more moist air up into the Arctic. This ridge is associated with the weather in uh, California. It's not getting the rainy season. Yeah. Uh, because of that ridge. And the ridge is also forming a trop to form over uh, eastern uh, America, which is causing all the very cold air to plunge down from the Arctic to the whole of uh, the United States. And this is just with some like 10% of the Arctic sea ice gone. We're seeing big changes in weather patterns. You know, what's going to happen when we lose 90%, which is what will happen if all that's left is about a million square kilometers yeah. uh, tucked in around the uh, Canadian archipelago and northern Greenland. It, it's going to be immense. You know, you could see uh, something like the, um, the, the monsoon, the Indian monsoon failing, and it may fail permanently. If that happens, you've got a billion people starving and looking for somewhere else to live. Yes, you do. I mean, but the try, you know, trying to predict all of this stuff. Uh, I mean, I personally, I mean, nobody obviously knows uh, 
what the, what this is going to look like and when it's going to look like and when it's going to look like whatever it's going to look like. But uh, I mean, any way you look at it, it, it it's not pretty. It's just not well, pretty. Sorry, what, what I find ironical is, is many people have said that when the crisis comes, the place to go to is New Zealand. Well, the sea surface temperature off New Zealand at the moment is something like about two or three degrees above normal. Yeah. You know, you could end up with um, with cyclones heading down there. You, you know, there's all sorts of things that uh, you just cannot predict. You yeah. can't predict. Man, you just don't know. You know, they say, "Well, we'll just grow food in a different place." Well, that's fine. You might get, on average, the right amount of water, but you'll get will get washed out in floods one year, and then you'll get a drought for two. <laughs> so that's the way it works. That's when the jet stream starts getting seriously messed up. That's the kind of thing that happens. Well, it, yeah, just trying to, to to pick one thing. It's it's it, it, it's just going to be it's going to be a hundred thousand things. At one time, where what what is your view of you know leading up to to the to the actual die off of, of humans and and I mean massive die off of humans and all our fellow Earthlings? Where do you see the 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 social the global social collapse? Uh, is, are we going to see that? Obviously, ahead of the uh, before we go over the the top, how, what is your vision of of the social disintegration from all of this mess? Absolutely, that that will come first, and I think it'll come at least start to come when people finally realise that this is irreversible and we're heading into the sixth mass extinction. This will come at some point. I would have thought that by now people would be starting to worry about it. But they're not, even even when we see things happening now that I thought wouldn't happen for another 10 years. But what will happen is that at some point people will start to realize that you know, we're, we're heading that way. Um, and you know, I'm lucky that I'm, I'm retired now. If I were in a job, a daytime job, I'd seriously be wondering whether it's worth me my while wasting my time going in to pay off a mortgage, to put money towards a pension, which I would never eventually yeah. see. So that's the bit that worries me about spreading this message. I want to spread it because, and this will come on to one of your later questions, I think what we must do about it, because I don't think we should sit down and sit back and, uh, and do nothing. So I want to spread the word so that we do something about it. But at the same time, I don't want to make people feel so um, disillusioned with life and despondent that uh, the the quality of life diminishes totally. It, 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 it's a difficult one, it really is. But yes, we will get social breakdown at some point when people start to realize that, hell, this is for real. I, I'm always saying that if you want to see the, the, this planet, you know, 15 years down the road, you go to sub-Saharan Africa today and, and walk around and, and you're going to see what you know? What it's going to start looking like fairly rapidly now? The U.S. and in, in, in yep. Europe will be the last to look like that. Uh, I'm thinking I might be naive, but do, do you somewhat agree with me that so that that sub-Saharan Africa is somewhat the poster child of the future of this planet? It's the future of parts of the planet. I can see southern Spain and Portugal going that way. Certainly, you know, they're getting temperatures now in the 40s regularly in the summer. And they're already suffering from water shortages, and Portugal had six times its normal wildfires. You know that those parts of the country, of the world like um, Iberia will start to see that. Other places it will be completely different. Um, the permafrost will turn to mush, but it won't be desert. Um, wildfires will clear a lot of places. There'll be dust bowls certainly in the states. Um, in Canada, for instance, I can see the trees dying off and burning, but you, again, it won't become a desert because it's probably yeah. too far for the sun to, 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 to get that, that hot. You will have um, also, you know, I've, I've mentioned before that you're going to get more places devastated by hurricanes and storms. The Caribbean will be largely uninhabitable. Even places like the Mediterranean, you know, I was in the south of France uh, a month or so ago. It was lovely. It was October, temperature about in the 20s, people were swimming. 
But the water off where I was staying, on the France-Italy border, was it reached over 30 degrees centigrade in the summer. Now, uh, hurricanes only need 28 and a half degrees to develop. So if you get a hurricane like the one that strayed up towards the British Isles, uh, Ophelia, a few months ago, if that drifts into the Mediterranean in August or September when the sea surface temperatures are the highest, it could strengthen. Yeah. And the building Mediterranean were not built to withstand hurricanes. <laughs> You know, it, it would just be flattened. And you, were, not... you weren't there when those big walls of wildfires were, were there in, in the background and with all these tourists out no, drinking the, their drinks on the beach? There were wildfires in that area of, uh, sort of southern France, but not when I was there. I think it was in sort of July, August when that happened. Well, I didn't see it. We, I don't have a car, so uh, we were staying there and traveling around by train and by bus. So yeah. we didn't manage to get far inland to see any uh, damage so I can see what it was like. Um, yeah, those, those pictures of those tourists out there lounging on the beach with that, yes. that, that wall of flame and, and uh, oh, hellfire yeah. and brimstone and they're lying there on the beach drinking their, drinking their pina coladas. I thought that was it's the it's classic perfect. picture of, of denial. But that's symptomatic. It's like the picture from uh, the States of the guy playing golf with the, yeah. the fire in California behind him. You know, yeah. you know, what does it take to get through to people? <laughs> uh, you know, and I continually hear people say, you know, science will fix it. Somebody will come along with a fix. If you look at all the fixes in the past, the things that we never knew was, were going to be around, then 10 years later, they're there. Then that will fix climate change. But it's the scale. It's the absolutely huge scale. Yeah. And I think this is what Peter Wadham's referred to. You're talking about $100 trillion it would cost to build these carbon capture storage machines that he was saying that could possibly save us. But even if we wanted to spend the money on it, there is no will to do it. Yeah. You'd have to turn yeah. over the factories that make all these goodies that people buy and then throw away a couple of weeks later. We'd have to convert all those to building carbon capture storage machines. And, you know, even if we did that, if you look at the amount of extra carbon being dumped into the atmosphere through the wildfires alone, then, you know, it, it would far outweigh the, the amount we could capture, uh, you know, over the next 10 years before we developed enough machines to make it really make an impact. It's, the, the scale is just so vast. Somebody else said to me, well, with the Arctic, we could put polystyrene balls or something in to the ocean to reflect the sunlight. I said, where are you going to get 14 million square kilometers worth of, of uh, plastic beads? You know, it's just not real what people are suggesting. Yeah, so it sounds like we're, we're entering, as it's, since we're 23 minutes in, it's, it's time anyway. Yeah. Which, which is my third question. Uh, is, is at this point where we are, and what are we, and with the President of the United States tweeting, uh, the, uh, laughing at all the global warming alarmists, uh, what are we going to do as, as a species to, to turn this train around uh, at this point? Is there any solution, any technological solution and or political will to rise to this challenge? Well, in short, no, there isn't. There, there's no political will. I think that uh, we need to do something, but uh, we cannot turn it around. All we can do is slow it down. You know, my estimate is that society will break down within 30 years. And I, that's a conservative estimate. If we get a huge methane blowout, we could be talking half of that time. Yeah. Uh, and um, that we'll be near human extinction You know, by the end of the century. Just just to, to, I know I hate to use that term by the end of the century because it switches people off, but my hope is when you're talking about extinction, then they might think it's a bit more serious than a two-meter rise in sea levels, for instance. You know, they, they, uh, but is there a will? There, there just isn't. I know we talk about uh, Donald Trump, we all laugh at him, and, and you know he's putting the accelerator onto it rather than trying to slow it down. But even Hillary Clinton, uh, even Barack Obama, you know, these uh, alternatives still haven't or wouldn't do anything near enough. You know, we get the same here in the UK. They put a few wind turbines up uh, and, yeah. and uh, a few solar panels, and they say, right, we're doing our bit. You know, the, the thing I really laugh at is this Earth Hour. Now, once in a year, <laughs> we 
switch our lights off for an hour and we'll feel really you know good about ourselves that we've done something done our bit to save the planet i'm sorry but if you want to do your bit to save the planet you pledge never to fly again and you give up your car you also turn vegetarian uh, and, and even that it probably won't be anything we're near enough but we, these are the kind of things that people have to start doing not turning the lights off or, or putting the plastic bottles into a recycling bin and I think that's they send the wrong message that, that you know give people that comfort that they're doing enough they're doing something uh, it's just not on people's radars and we've got to get it onto people's radars so, well, assuming I, I understand that this is good, what is the term suspending disbelief or whatever they call it? Assuming there were the political will, tech, just technologically, uh, I, I mean, what 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 are we got? CC and all we got carbon capture and storage, and we got geoengineering, which uh, I I sloppily use the word chemtrails. I mean, that's the, that's what I hear them talking. But either we're going to suck the stuff out of the air, or we're going to reflect the sunlight back, and, and all I'm hearing is that this is orchestrated by the fossil fuel industry, so we can keep on with business as usual, yeah. because science is going to come on. We can just, we don't have to worry about not driving or, or, or flying airplanes, because we're going to have machines sucking the shit out of the air, and other machines reflecting it back into the sky. Yeah, and Peter Wadham has put it very well. He says that geoengineering should be just a temporary uh, fix, if you like, just to buy us a little bit more time. And the carbon capture and storage, it has to be something along the lines of the post-war Marshall Plan, where we really turn over all our factories. We start producing cars for a start, or aeroplanes, and we start building within these factories huge, huge carbon capture and storage machines. Uh, that's the, the kind of thing that that, that we would need to do. Um, uh, I just, uh, I, I, you know, if, if there were a political will to address this, we would not only not be building more runways, like Heathrow Airport is going to get a new runway. I think Berlin, uh, Berlin Airport, they're building a new one there. We should be closing them down. Well, we go over to China them. if you want to see airport construction. Yeah. We should be closing them down and uh. should be investing in rail lines and making the price of running a car so high that you know it just becomes prohibitive. Obviously, you have to put in measures in place to help those who live in rural communities and all the rest of it. But the problem is when you say to people, we all have to stop flying, they say, well, what about people who've got family in uh, another part of the world? And I say, well, well, fine, we'll address that bit last. Uh, you know, they'll say, uh, given up the car, what about people who live in rural communities? Well, we'll put something in place to help them. They may be exceptions. But the, the low-hanging fruit is that people who fly from Edinburgh to London should not be allowed to do it. People who, who, who drive but live in a city should not be allowed to do it. Uh, and when I say should not be allowed to, that can be done by taxation. It doesn't have to be yeah. done by legal means. But, you know, we really have to be changing lifestyles. And that is the big People do not want to change their lifestyles. They will do anything. They will face mass extinction for their children and grandchildren rather than change their lifestyles. And that is what depresses me most, I think. Well, you know, I mean, I'm, I, I'm always owning up. To, I did get rid of my car for six and a half years, but, but three years ago I caved again. I, I drove more miles in the year 2017 probably than any year of my entire life and and here i am i, I i'm your old doomsday prophet eco nazi up here pre preaching this shit and, and i'm driving i'm putting more miles on my truck on my gas sucking truck in the year 2017 than any year of my life uh shoot me you know i admit i'm but i i'm i, I i'm worse than a clueless moron uh, you know, I, I, I'm not clueless, but I'm, I'm total, I'm a total moron because, you know, I just rationalize that, well, if everybody else would stop driving, so would I, but what's the point of me stopping to drive when, 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 when there's 25 million cars are going to be sold in China next year and yeah. India doubling their number of cars in the next 10 years? It, it's, it's, a, it's a joke. And if you look at uh, the, you know, the amount of carbon put into the atmosphere by other means, you know, the, the wildfires in British Columbia, one, one province in, in Canada, uh, it's emitted enough carbon dioxide, I think it's about 190 million tonnes, 
which is equivalent to about 40 billion cars on the road yeah. every year. You know, the, the, the scale is just so, so huge that uh, I just cannot see any way, no matter what we do, to fix it. Uh, what? Just real quickly, touch on uh, one, one, one of my one of my favorite subjects. Of course, is the Paris Climate Accord. What? 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 What is? Give 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 us your summation of the Paris, which of course for I call him Barack Obama. Uh, you, you know, is going to save the planet with that. Uh, what is your opinion of that UN agreement? Well. When we had the first uh, COP meetings back in um, Copenhagen, places like that, it was a good idea to get people together, work out a plan. But all they've done since then is they've all flown in, had a good time, decided when the next meeting is going to be, and all flown back again. Yeah. And all it's doing now is it's it, the Paris Agreement, you know, even assuming that they all stick to it, we're still nowhere near what's needed, and they're not even going to stick to it. Yeah. So, uh, oh, it's a bit like switching your lights off for an hour once a year. It's making everyone feel, oh, somebody's addressing it. Somebody somewhere is dealing with it. Not my problem. I want to go back to doing something else. Yeah. So, I, 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 okay, hold on. I need, I hate to say, I, this damn battery is, it might be going out on me. Uh, let me go grab another battery. We're going to talk, and I'm just letting people know that if this goes off suddenly, there will be a part two. Let me go grab this other battery, yes. and we'll get back to this. I really thought that uh, I had an hour in this battery, but I guess not. Hold on. It, there, there's a chance that it'll uh, that that it'll make it till the uh, that it that that it'll make it till the end. So so anyway, the Paris Climate Agreement it. It doesn't sound like you put a lot of faith in it to to save us. I don't hear no. much cheering on the Paris Climate Agreement. No, no, it's just just depressing. It's it's just not ambitious at all. You know, I don't think people understand what's really needed now. We've left it. You know, the kind of agreement that came out of Paris would have been great about thirty years ago. Yeah, I think yeah. We made agreement then and start addressing. Uh, the carbon emissions and also put in the research and development into renewables because the problem, you know, I had a meeting last week with a, I'll not say who it is, but it's a, a quite a well known uh, financier. He used to be a fellow councillor in, uh, in Midlothian and he's a, he's a sort of right wing economist and uh, he's a multi millionaire who's made his fortune through finance. And he read my blog because I said I said to him I deliberately sent it to him. I said because if anyone can pick holes in it, say this is rubbish, you'll do it. And he couldn't believe. Um, he came back and said, "Wow!" He says, "You're absolutely right." He forwarded it on to other people, and they came back and uh, and said, "Yeah, I think he's right. I don't think we, we have got a chance." So. Um, so I had lunch with him uh, last week, and you know, uh, and he was saying, but there's this plan, uh, and he sent me a video clip of some Dutch uh, scientists saying that this plan to build, to, to plant a billion trees, which which, uh, which was sound, you know, would have been sound 30 years ago, because uh, it, it changes the, uh, the, the, the the water vapor in the in the local. Uh, area where the trees are planted, mm -hmm. etc. But it takes, you know, sapling's not a tree, it takes about 20 years for it to become a, a mature tree. But I was saying to him, you know, okay, a billion trees sounds a lot, but according to a recent article I read just a few days ago, they reckon that they're losing something like about six billion trees a year globally yeah. through fires. Now, how much of that is extra on top of what we would normally lose, I don't know, but I would imagine it's at least a billion. So, you know, people come up with these ideas uh, and I say, well, you know, look at it in, in perspective. It sounds like a big deal, but it's not. You know, the scale, the huge, huge scale, meant that, you know, if you go back uh, 30 years, we should have put research and development into renewables then when the, the, the market uh, economy said it wasn't worthwhile. Cause it, the, there are two problems with the, the free market economy, apart from, well, there's lots of problems, but two particular one, ones here. One is it's reactive. So the incentive is not there to develop renewables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
until the oil price goes sky high. Um, so that that's uh, a, a, a major problem uh, in terms of um, research and development. What is your general but, take on uh, the, 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 the big three renewables, uh, solar panels, wind turbines, and electric vehicles? Where? Well, can I come on to that? Just, just, just finish what the okay. point I was made. There's another big problem with the free market uh, economy, and that's the lack of accounting for what are called externalities. Mm -hmm. So that oh, if yeah. you drive in your car, then the cost to the environment, to health, to uh, global warming is not included yeah. in the price to pay for a gallon. We're paying that price now by insurance companies having to fork out for buildings that burn down in California, for for example. So, so the, the, the free market was never designed to cater for something that needs long-term planning like we've needed for the last, last 30 years. So in terms of sort of renewables, etc., you know, what I think about, um, yeah, it'd be great, but we can't have everybody driving around in an electric car. For one thing, where are you going to get the materials for the batteries from? There are already human rights implications of child labor, etc., and health implications of people mining for lithium. Uh, these batteries, uh, they need to be replaced in about within 10 years. Yeah. They don't last forever. Now, you can recycle them and much of uh, what goes into them. But again, there are resource energy implications of doing that. Again, it goes back to people not wanting to change their lifestyle. We can't all go around driving vehicles, even if they're electric ones, because if people in the developed world are doing it, we can't say, yeah, we can carry on, but the people in India, the people in China who currently don't have them, they can't have them because there's not enough resources for it. And where are you going to get all the electricity from? You know, if you, your solar panels are great, but you're talking about huge, huge amounts of this. And wind turbines as well. Again, they don't last forever. They take resources. We have to simplify our lifestyles or nature will do it for us. There you go. Well, what, I think that is an excellent place since my battery is really doing, saying any second. I, I'm going to...